Great. So uh, welcome, everybody. I'm delighted today to be joined here by Nimo Bassi from Nigeria. And Nimo, it's such an honor to have this opportunity to, to interview you for our class, but also for the wider uh, Right Livelihood Network. And I know many people take uh, much inspiration from your work. And I wanted to begin the interview simply by inviting you to introduce yourself a little bit and, and say what your, what your work has focused on these last few years um, and um, how that's led into um, how you currently are trying to make sense of what's happening in our world in relationship to environmental crises, but other crises too. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, it's my pleasure to be on this conversation at this time. Um, well, as already introduced, my name is Nimo Basi. I currently lead an ecological think tank based here in Nigeria, but focused on Africa. It's called the Health of Mother Earth Foundation, HOMEF. And um, it's an organization I, co I founded uh, nine years ago. And uh, after leading another organization for more than two decades. And so um, uh, it was founded based on the experience I had in environmental justice campaigns over more than two decades, uh, which was combining environmental justice with human rights. Uh, and now my focus is on three main planks. Uh, I, I work on fossil politics. Uh, that's, that sounds like a big name, but what I really do there is climate justice. It's about fighting for the rights of forest communities, fighting against uh, pollution by oil companies, and standing with communities generally to defend their ecosystems uh, for their livelihoods and for their co complete lives generally. Um, then I also work on what we call hunger politics. And basically what we do in that track of work is to ask the question, why are people hungry? And so we support food sovereignty, support agroecology, work with farmers, with students. And we, we believe that Agriculture can, if done in harmony with nature, uh, can actually help resolve a lot of crises and problems we have in the world, including climate, the climate crisis. That you have healthy soils and a more natural way of growing crops, you're going to help cool the planet and produce healthy food. Uh, the, the other thing we do is what brings everything together. We call it the Kike. Kike is found in two Nigerian languages talks about knowledge and the right to use your knowledge and the agency of your knowledge. Uh, and so we're trying to, as a learning organization, to learn from the, the wise, which is learn from the elders, share experiences, and then bring this to the broader work that we do. And it, it, it's so inspiring the way you, you make these connections between working on uh, in, in the broader climate crisis, environmental crises, and practical action towards uh, advancing people as a, people's access to living a healthier life uh, through food justice. Um, I mean, right now we, we are also enduring on top of climate crises and various food access crises, a global health crisis caused by a pandemic. And I'm wondering how you kind of view that crisis in relationship to all the other things you uh, work, are working on. Uh, it, one of the things I think is very inspiring about your work is the ability to keep it going through um, you know, multiple rounds, the upheavals in Nigeria, um, all sorts of political crises, um, and, and you just keep going. And now we have to keep going through this pandemic crisis too. And I'm wondering how you kind of put it all together. Uh, well, uh, I, I believe life is a whole tapestry. It's, 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 it's everything woven together. That's what life is all about. And so uh, it's impossible to actually tackle environmental problems in silos. Everything is connected. Our ecosystems are all interconnected. They're complex, interlinked. We talk about climate change. That connects to food, connects to health, connects to 
everything, culture, spirituality, economic well-being, everything is so interconnected. And we always have to look at them together. And then what keeps us going is the hope that we can do better. Yeah. That humans, do, uh, humans have enough wisdom to break away from destructive, harmful, and unhelpful patterns of living. Uh, so as with, with that confidence that we can do better, we just push on and keep pushing on, hoping that things will, believing that things will change. If we can change enough mindsets towards what we're here for, what we're not here just to accumulate and compete and harm other people because we have the power, but we work, we're be better off when we work in solidarity, we work in harmony, not just with other people, but with Mother Earth. Uh, the pandemic has, has provided real serious problems and it has given more tools for, the, for those who exploit the system uh, to avoid climate action, to avoid preserving biodiversity or to grab things, or just, just simply to, to make life more complicated for the vulnerable in, in the world today. And the whole climate negotiations have become a platform for avoiding climate action. It's like if you go to those negotiation, negotiations and you come back with the, the least demand on your nation, then you, you believe that you've succeeded. Because I mean, you can go back, do nothing, and you don't care how the storm comes and what happens because of your inaction. Politicians are just happy to do nothing. This is why we have the rise of net zero uh, arguments. Net zero, they all propose net zero by 2050, net zero by 2060, net zero by 2070, because as if it's nothing to worry about today, but something to worry about three decades down the road. It's really incredible. Uh, but the, what are, the, the, the pandemic has succeeded, has been used rather, to cut off the most vulnerable, those highly impacted by climate crisis and by land grab and other problems from being at the negotiation table. Imagine the, the conference of parties that, were, that just was just held in October, November in Glasgow, the climate, climate conference. Um, a lot of people could not go there. Uh, I even, even those who went there, some from the red listed countries had to stay in isolation, in quarantine for some days. And even after crossing all the barriers, only um, two delegates per country could sit in one particular negotiation hall. And a lot of people, including observers, and NGOs and so on and so forth had to stay away from the negotiation hall and just watch proceedings on, on computer yeah. screens or TV sets. It, what we could do. It reminds me uh, a little bit of Naomi Klein's arguments around disaster capitalism and how every new disaster is somehow uh, cannibalized and turned into uh, another way of doing business as usual, advancing the interests of elites as usual, and so on and so forth. And it seems like COVID, in the way you've described it there, has been used to advance uh, business as usual uh, ar around climate uh, and, and keep people away from democratic uh, deliberation over what we can do about it. So, so what can we do about that? Now, how can we struggle back? Um, and sort of as uh, one of the things I, I, I think COVID has also done is it, it's, it's shown us a much faster kind of time frame of, of global change. It's, it's high, just like the climate crisis, it highlights interdependencies of shared vulnerabilities and so forth, but it's all happened in a time frame that's faster than um, the, you know, the Thwaites ice uh, uh, sheet breaking off into the uh, ocean and flooding coastal communities and so forth. It's happening so fast. Um, is there a way we can respond in, in, with speed in this context on the ground to sort of turn the crisis into an opportunity for progressive action, um, not just on health justice, but on other agendas like, like the environment? <laughs> uh, I, I think it's a very difficult preposition to, to change the system um, by tackling the things that the pandemic is bringing up. But the pandemic really shows uh, that many nations and uh, politicians are very narrow-minded. Yeah. Um, most politicians, not all. Uh, and uh, 
when it comes to look at global problems, people still tend to think of global problems in tiny blocks on at national level. So this, this, this level of nationalism that doesn't look at the global situation. Uh, this is the way that I believe decision makers prefer to see things. And that is why we have in the Paris Agreement as well, uh, which is going forward to the Glasgow Park Climate Park, we're having what is known as the nationally determined contributions. We have a global problem and you want to solve them by national narrow uh, uh, insulated problems without looking at interconnections with what, what is going on elsewhere. And so we need to check, it's a mind shift that we need. We need to tackle the mind shift, to shift our minds by, by storytelling, by direct action, uh, and by uh, delegitimizing the spaces where global decisions are being made at this time. Look at something like the Convention of Biodiversity. Uh, they had that COP, part of the COP15 or thereabout or something uh, was held in October uh, 2021. Uh, in one day, and a whole lot of that was virtual, not, not in person. Now, how many people, what was the level of uh, the quality of connection that can get everybody in the world to discuss without being together face to face? And, the, and, and very far reaching decisions are being made at this kind, of, this kind of meeting. So we have to find a way of, we have decentralizing, decentralizing these multilateral spaces. Let's have the negotiations in blocks and they bring the conclusions together. It will be much easier to reach decisions. We have to find a creative way, a creative way of, of shaking our mind mindsets. And then by working, uh, getting the popular spaces, popular pop space to work more in solidarity across regions to actually take the driving seat for decision making yeah. away from just a few people who are listening only to corporations. Right. And do you think there's room in this regard for civil society networks like the Right Livelihood Network to play a role? Obviously, they can't do everything, but play a role in forging those kinds of uh, connections and um, advancing uh, knowledge sharing, uh, advancing social movement uh, across borders more effectively. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I believe that this is something that networks like the Right Livelihood Foundation, uh, Lores can, can, can do. And this is what the Right Livelihood College can also, colleges can also, we need to just sow the seeds. Uh -huh. These are the seeds that will bring about the change. And when we sow enough seeds, the harvest is going to come. Uh, and because we're a network of, we have a network, this is a net, we're talking about a network of people from diverse actions. And, and because the, the, these are not single issue campaigns where the right level colleges and the Lawrence Network provide the right, the right kind of platform where this change we're talking about can, can trigger, be triggered. Uh, and then, of course, working with other networks of other groups and groupings of people. And what, what would you say to students who want to be part of that work? Uh, what would you say to them about joining it? What do they have to think about to, to make themselves useful and to, to um, participate effectively in that kind of networking effort? Well, I think the, if the students should be the most inspired and the most challenged to want to be a part of this network because it's all about them. It's about their future. Yeah. Uh, when politicians say they're going to attain net zero by 2050, it's not about the future of the politician talking. 2070, as India proposed, it's not about the president of India. It's about the young people who are students today and their children coming after them. And so this, to me, should be enough inspiration that they have to be the driving seat for the change that will make this planet habitable that will build better harmonious relationship with people from across the globe. And that will also ensure that we also respect our relatives who are the other species that we share the planet with. Right, right. Which, I mean, takes us back to the origins of, of, of COVID, which seem to have uh, come out of up, environmental upheavals, uh, you know, displacing bats from their uh, regular uh, ecological habitat and uh, creating uh, corporatized food systems in China and elsewhere that create the sort of breeding grounds for new, uh, new viruses to jump species. Uh, so, 
So it seems like uh, uh, there's a, another from from at least from my point of view, another lesson of of COVID is that work on uh, the environmental future can also benefit us in in warding off those kinds of uh, pandemic dangers too. So, yeah. Uh, I think it's the only way we can preserve our health and our sanity <laughs> because the, the, the complex webs of life that nature provides, our ecosystem provides, the natural habitats that we can interact with other beings and with things that are either plants or animals or whatever, uh, when we are in harmony with them, we have more stable, our health is more stabilized. And everything, the fruits that we pick from the trees that grow, the indigenous trees around our territories that are most suited to preserve our health. We don't have to wait for food that comes from 2,000 miles away uh, that our body is not really configured to tolerate, you know, just because we can afford to pay for it or to import it. Uh, so really, this is the, the, the most complex problems in the world today has to be solved with the most basic common sense. Yeah. live in harmony with yourself and with nature that's a great way to end this interview Nima. thank you so much for that insight and all the others you shared with us i really appreciate your time and i know our students will too thanks so much thank you very much have a lovely day thank you <laughs>